Parry brings it back. He centers, but Stan Crowther's there. He clears, but Edwards returns it, and Lofthouse runs in for a lightning goal. Less than three minutes play, and Bolton are one up already. United are shaken, but they try to hit back. Colin Webster, who's changed over to the right wing, bulldozes his way through towards the Wanderers' goal. He centers, and this might be it. Bobby Charlton beats Higgins. Taylor shoots, and a beautiful save by Eddie Hopkinson. United are soon sweeping back to worry him again, but nothing seems able to pierce that Bolton defense. Back and half-backs work smoothly together, and the Manchester attacks break against them like waves against a rock. And time and again, defense turns into attack, but Harry Greggs found his form and holds them off. So the second half starts with Bolton still only one up, but pressing hard and giving Greg little peace. The Wanderers' experience is telling over United's enthusiasm, and Manchester seem to be finding it difficult to work as a team. Brilliant individual efforts peter out through lack of support. Now Bolton winger Birch has it, but Alec Dawson, switching wings again, gets it away. Dawson to Charlton. Charlton passes. Back to Charlton, who shoots, but it bounces off the upright into Hopkinson's hands. Hard luck, Manchester. That was Bolton's closest shave yet. After Manchester end again, with Bolton moving in fast, Dennis Stevens shoots, Greg parries, but Nat Lofthouse charges in, and there's Bolton's second goal. Nat's charge seemed fair enough, but it's flawed Harry Gregg, and play is held up for a minute or two while the trainer attends to him. It's an anxious moment, especially for Matt Busby, but there's no serious damage, and Harry's on his feet again. Webster runs in and shoots. Hopkinson can't hold it, but Higgins tips it away. But there's the whistle. Bolton Wanderers have scored the fourth cup victory of their history. Reunited, Busby and Murphy determined to build another great side. The loss of a generation of brilliant players had been compounded by the necessity to rush youngsters ahead of schedule. There was no alternative but to buy established talent. Albert Quicksall, Maurice Setters, Noel Cantwell, David Hurd, Dennis Law and Pat Crerand were expensive acquisitions as the late 1950s turned into the early 1960s. The signing of Law for £115,000 was a British record. The investments paid dividends when United won the FA Cup in 1963. David Hurd kicks off. Manchester United in red shirts, Leicester City in white. The cup final has begun. Giles passes to David Hurd, and his shot tests Banks. Ferran spots that inside left Dennis Law is well placed. Just watch how that Scottish wonder turns the pass to complete advantage. United have scored the all-important first goal. Law's on the warpath again. This time it seems incredible that City's goal can escape. Yet it does. One good thing for United, Bobby Charlton's in great form. He shoots, it goes to Hurd, and it's in the net. Tragically for Leicester, Banks fumbles. Ready to pounce on it is David Hurd. It's all over, the end of an exciting, very sporting game. On the field, congratulations all round. United's captain, Noel Cantwell, leads his men up to the Royal Box. For them all, it's the fulfillment of an English footballer's ambition a cup and a cup medal. Incidentally, it's a moment of triumph for their manager, Matt Busby. Proof that he has most successfully rebuilt United. We shall never forget the Munich air tragedy.
the star of the 1963 FA Cup final, was soon to be hailed by the Stretford Enders as the king, Dennis Law. They got this uh, saying of calling someone the king, and I think uh, Dennis Law was the first ever was called the king here. I've been associated with Dennis Law all his football life, because really, in the early days, our youth team played uh, Huddersfield at Heckman Dwight in a terrible night, and the, 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 there was someone causing a bit of trouble, and I found out it was a blonde little elfin called Law, and I went to Andy Beatty after the match and offered him ten thousand pounds for that Dennis Law at the time. He had tremendous skill. He had this uh, great asset of tremendous acceleration. Kid looking for that one, and Law! There it is by Dennis Law! Well, would you believe it? And over comes the centre trying to find it, that's Law! What a goal! What a goal! The man saw him as, as his ideal type of player. Everything he was looking for. Entertainer, expressive, um, that, that little bit of aggression, you know, everything that you want in a professional player. Law was saying he wants it in the air, so too does Gowling. And Law, in fact, with an overhead kick, and it's there! Though spending, Busby remained convinced that home-produced players were essential to the club's prosperity. Further evidence of the wisdom of that policy emerged in the fragile-looking frame of an Irish youth named George Best. He had to be left to do things naturally. He had this tremendous ability. The people were there, they, they just... Uh, waiting to see George Best, the one waiting to see anybody else. Charlton, United moving forward again. Manchester there, George Best, a lot of room to work. Gibbons on his right. Best again. A glorious goal by Best. What a magnificent goal by Best. Brian Kidd. To George Best. Fitzpatrick. Best going in on it. Best! Oh, beautifully taken by Best! Now heard. Good dummy has Best up in front of him. This is Best, wriggling out space, what a fine set, what a fine shot, Georgie Best, number seven, the incredible George Best scores his 17th goal of the season. Good header by Moore for Best, and a great goal! Making space for his cross and Best! George Best. So two dummies and an hour's made a chance for himself. His hand trick! None of Busby's players enjoyed greater prestige than Bobby Charlton. He was great in, in every way. If he put that uh, jersey on, no matter at the height of his career, he was playing for 90 minutes. If we were, if we were playing a, a small club, it didn't mean any difference. He never relied on his, uh, his name. You never saw him easing off and saying we're playing this, but he give he was an example that way. He gave everything he got all the time. And of course, uh, the qualities he had were tremendous. A tremendous rhythm in his movement. It was, uh, it's not just something that you very rarely see. He used to glide past people in, in ease. And, and then if he sent a ball, he passed the ball a short one or even a long one. It was so accurate. And then you get the position when he came in and uh, 25 yards he did this sort of stick shot, finishing off, he scored his goal. Nice little pass there to Kidd. Best going on, Charlton coming up as well. And on the far side it's Aston. Straight into the path of Charlton! That's the equaliser from Bobby Charlton! Best, Law and Charlton are evocative of a glorious era in which other unforgettable figures also had important roles to play. Nobby Styles, toothless and myopic, but a tiger nonetheless, would win the ball and pass it on to an artist. Pat Crerand, a £43,000 signing from Celtic, was pure geometry. Bill Fuchs, like Charlton, a Munich survivor, commanded respect in the thick of the defence. In goal, Alex Stepney whom Busby claimed turned a good team into a championship team. Now that Busby had assembled the necessary parts for his pattern of play, he was ready to challenge for the championship again. 
A superior goal average enabled United to beat Leeds to the title in 1964-65. And another triumph in 1966-67 was sealed with a 6-1 victory at West Ham. There was a period of about five years which was absolutely beautiful. Beautiful from the fans' point of view, it was lovely for, uh, for the players to play under a manager whose basic uh, speech was really, I know you can play football, go out and play your football to the best of your ability. And as long as you've tried your best, uh, can ask for no more. Win, lose, or draw. So it was a lovely philosophy. And it was a lovely philosophy in that we felt in the team, if we were trailing 2-0, we always had a feeling that we'd win 3-2. <laughs> celebrations had only just begun. United were determined to extend their supremacy into Europe. Re-entry had come with success in the FA Cup in 1963, and the early signs were promising. The Dutch side, Willem II, were United's opponents in the first round of the European Cup Winners' Cup. The second leg of the tie at Old Trafford was a rout. United winning 6-1. The second round was a domestic affair. United meeting Tottenham, the holders, in the first ever tie between two English clubs. Spurs won the first leg in London, 2-0. United made amends by winning the return, 4-1. Sadler's pass finds Hurd. He dives. To net a beautiful goal. For Spurs, Greaves shoots. Just over. Hurd has the ball. It's a goal. Spurs are two down at this stage, but they're still in the game. Even their defence turns to attack. Right fullback Peter Baker is up there to show what he can do. The ball goes to Jimmy Greaves, and it's one for Spurs. United must have two more goals to win on aggregate. Bobby Charlton scores. A shot by Hurd gives no difficulty to the Brown. In the dying minutes of the game, Charlton scores again. A fine attacking performance in the home leg of their quarter-final against Sporting Lisbon gave United a 4-1 advantage to take to Portugal. wrong in the return match. United lost 5-0, their heaviest European defeat. We went over there to Lisbon and expecting it to be, because don't forget most of us were fairly new to European football and we expected it to be, well, a, a comfortable victory and I remember going through I think after five minutes and, and in those days the posts were square over there, not like they are now, and I remember beating somebody and knocking it, and I thought, well, that's that's a goal, and it hit the corner and came back out. Well, of course, we could have been 5-1 up then, and then all of a sudden, they hit us with everything. I mean, we never, never got a, a kick at all. They were a very skillful side, but we, as the years went on, we'd have approached it in a far different way. There was renewed optimism when United regained entry to the European Cup in 1966. The mood was heightened by a remarkable performance away to Benfica in the quarter-finals. Benfica kicked off with Eusebio, reckoned Europe's best player in evidence, though Manchester United's defence was not to be caught napping. Dennis Law and the rest of Matt Busby's men had only one thought, attack. After seven minutes, the ball went to George Best. Goal! A shark that to the all-conquering Benfica, unbeaten on this ground for years. But there has to be a start for everything. Best had the ball again. Another goal. Bobby Charlton started another attack. Heard to Connelly. Goal number three. 
At halftime, United 3, Benfica 0. And...